so good morning everyone. My name is Christophe Basso. I'm with Future Electronics that I joined in uh, July 2021 as a business development manager. And we are here this morning live from PTIM 2024. And I'm going to show you a small tech talk of 10 minute uh, discussion about the uh, flux balancing and uh, analog control in the dual active bridge converter. So we'll go briefly uh, through a, a quick description of the uh, dual active bridge converter, abbreviated DAB. Then we go uh, through the problem of the magnetizing current, how to drive duty ratios for loop control that I have installed, and then compensating the loops, which is also an important exercise when you talk about uh, switching power supplies. So the dual active bridge converter is actually a power converter featuring two full bridges, one in the primary side and another one in the secondary side. The secondary side bridge can be seen as an active rectifier. And you can see here there is an inductance which is located on the primary side, which is going to be used for controlling the power flow from the source on the left side to the load on the secondary side. This is what we call a bi-directional converter. So it means the power flow can be from the left side to the right side or from the right side to the left side, depending actually on the sign of the phase light that you can see, because we're going to have an overlap between the two legs here, which depends on the phase, which is the control variable. So the exercise here will be to talk about the magnetizing current, which can potentially drift and affect the converter's operation. When I, st when I start talking about power supply, I always like to uh, think about loop control. And when you want uh, to uh, think about loop control, you need to go through a small signal analysis. Because again, the ultimate uh, exercise is to obtain the control to output transfer function. So it means here, if I start exciting the control variable here, what type of response will, uh, will be obtained on the output voltage? So you start with a nonlinear equation that you can see here, and you apply what we call partial differentiation, meaning you determine the sensitivity of that equation to some of the variables, which are the duty ratio here or the input voltage you end up with an average model, which is a first order model, you can see on the right side here. And this model can be extended as well if you are interested to look at the input current. So here, uh, you're gonna, you start with the same equation, but this time you control the same control variable, which is D, but you are interested by the current flowing in the input. What you do in the end, when you have this average model, you would like to compare it to either lab results to validate the model or to another model that can be run cycle by cycle with Simplex. And you can see that, and that's, that is the reason why I called it a first order model. In the low frequency part, you can see a very good match between the magnitude and the phase, between symmetrics, which is the average model, and Simplex, which is the cycle by cycle model on the control to output transfer function, but as well on the control to input current transfer function. And you can see it's a very a classical first order type of response with a zero and a pole located at low frequencies. Anytime you deal with a power transformer, you need to check the magnetizing current because the magnetizing current is the one which is going to incur core losses and it has to remain in control all the time to avoid what we call flux walk away, which in the end will provoke transformer saturation. And transformer saturation is, is a catastrophic failure. So what people do, generally speaking, they insert what we call a DC block capacitor. And that DC block capacitor will make sure that in case there is any offset in the full bridge structure controlling the transformer, then in that particular case, you will start creating a DC offset, which may lead to catastrophic failure. This DC link capacitor sees the primary side current, which can be quite high, and it could be a bulky and costly capacitor. So what people do, they assemble all this capacitor in parallel, for instance. You have to make sure that the PCB layout is well done for proper current sharing. And in the end, it can be a major, it can have a major impact on the bill of material. Where is this offset uh, coming from? Actually, the thing is that we can lump all the ohmic losses into equivalent resistance in the primary side and the secondary side. And the magnetizing current needs to be reconstructed from the primary current minus the scale 
down or scaled up current from the secondary side to actually recreate this variable, which is the magnetizing current. And you see that the DC offset in the magnetizing current depends on this resistance here, which are purposely kept low because the designer wants to have the best possible efficiency. So it means if these elements are naturally very low, any small DC offset on the control signals naturally will bring a, a, DC, a, DC, a DC drift. You can see here some, some examples. Uh, these are taken from a paper published by, by ZTH. So it's a monster converter, 160 kilowatt, operating at a quite large switching period, I would say. But even here, a 2.5 nanosecond timing error will generate a DC shift of 50 millitesla. And operating the transformer closer to saturation naturally will incur larger call losses and may, let's say, reduce the safety margin in case you have a transient or a problem on, on the control section. So as I said, you cannot directly observe the magnetizing current. You need to reconstruct it through this very simple equation. What I've done here in the, this tech talk, and it's about the poster presentation that I'm going to show in a few hours, it's, uh, it's inspired from a paper published by the Delta people in 2025, in 2015, sorry. And this was digital control. Here the approach is 100% analog, but the principle remains the same. I'm observing the magnetizing current, which is here, and I'm keeping the average to zero. At the same time, I'm also looking at the primary side current that I will also keep to zero, implying that if primary current and magnetizing current are equal to zero, then naturally the secondary side current will also be equal to zero, lowering all the RMS content circulating in the, in the average in the secondary side, but also in the primary side. So here you see that the modulator will classically drive the juicy ratio of each leg. And I want to slightly insert a small plus or minus offset on the control signal to adjust the magnetizing current and the primary side and secondary side current. For that purpose, I built a dedicated modulator, which is going to be transparent when inserted inside the modulation flow, which means that if this voltage here is equal to zero, then I've got exactly the required duty ratio. And if I start modulating the voltage uh, on the control input, then the duty ratio will be modulated by plus minus 5%, which is exactly what I'm looking at. As any loop control exercise, you need the control to output transfer function. So here, the first output will be, or the first response will be the magnetizing current, controlled through the secondary side duty ratio. And the second loop will, uh, the response will be the primary side current, which will be controlled by the uh, primary side average or full bridge. Because these are loops that needs to to be compensated, you need the AC response, of course, to look at, and you need to correct the deficiencies of this loop to close the loop. So we have three loops there. There are two inner loops, one looking at the magnetizing current, the other one looking at the primary side current, and then the overall loop, which is maintaining the, the output voltage or the output current, depending, depending on the regulated variable, a constant. So this is the loop which is looking over the two inner loops, whereas here you can see the modulator. So I am injecting here the AC stimulus and I'm going to look at uh, how it propagates through the sensor that I have here. Once this is done, I can look at the overall stability when the two inner loops are turned off and make sure that when they are turned off, I have one given body plot here, 10 kilohertz crossover frequency with 55 degrees phase margin. And when I turn the inner loop on, then make sure that the outer loop is not disturbed at all. And you can see that here, I have the same crossover frequency with a very good phase margin when the two loops are active in the primary side. And then the final exercise is to run a transient step. Here I'm stepping the current from 15 to 25 amps. You can see there is a very decent deviation on the output voltage. It's a 500 volt output. But on average, the magnetizing current slightly deviates during the transient and then immediately returns to zero on average, which is exactly what we were looking at. 
very quickly on the conclusion. So we see that the DAP converter can be subject to drift, DC drift, which will actually move up or down the DC operating point of the magnetizing current, which is something you want to avoid. You want to stay away from saturation to avoid catastrophic failures. People usually resort to a DC block capacitor, but this DC block capacitor is bulky, costly, and may affect the reliability of the converter. One possible option or one possible approach is to go through specific loops that are going to uh, maintain or keep the magnetizing current and the primary side current to zero on average and make sure that the transformer uh, keeps a stable operating point. Okay? Thank you very much for your time.